My name is Louise Huang, and I direct the Center for Research in Science, and I have the distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Stan Rosenberg. Dr. Rosenberg is the founding director of Scholarship and Christianity in Oxford, or commonly known as SCIO. He is also a member of Wycliffe Hall and the University of Oxford's Theology and Religion faculty, teaching early Christian history and doctrine. He is a member also of the Oxford Center for Late Antiquity and an associate member of the Ian Ramsey Center for Science and Religion. His research and teaching interests focus on Augustine's works, early Christian cosmology, and his relationship to Greco-Roman science, culture, and philosophy, and the interplay between intellectual and popular thought during this period. Um, he is a prolific grant writer and awardee. I don't think I can spend time reading all the grants that he applied and got awarded, but some major funders include the Templeton Religion Trust, Blank Meyer Foundation, Biologos Foundation, and Dr. Rosenberg is also an author of many articles, journals, and um, books, and I have one in my hand right now, which is one of his newest, I believe, isn't it? Um, and I have given that away to some science faculty, finding ourselves after Darwin. Uh, you can go ahead and take a look afterwards. Um, he is also on the International Advisory Council of the Museum of the Bible, advising on both science and the Bible, and as such. Now, I think um, if we were to peel aside all these titles and accomplishments and all that, um, if I may, uh, describe Dr. Rosenberg as a brilliant historian at heart and to me truly a remarkable visionary. Would you help me warmly welcome Dr. Stan Rosenberg. Well, thank you. Now let me dissuade you from all those wonderful platitudes. Um, <laughs> but that was really a generous introduction. Thank you, Louise. It's a delight to be here at Azusa. Uh, I have had many wonderful years of working with the Azusa faculty and students over my 20 years in Oxford uh, that I've been uh, celebrated 20 years this summer of being in Oxford, uh, running this center and developing the program and developing research and scholarship opportunities more broadly for the Christian colleges. And working with many of your faculty here over the years, uh, not the least of which is Bobby Duke, uh, with projects we've done together at the Museum of the Bible and uh, other related activities. Um, and of having had Mark Eaton and uh, Louise Hong with us in Oxford for the Bridging Two Cultures project. So a uh, delight to be here and thank you for the very warm and resonant greeting and introduction. Uh, so my area, as you've heard, is late antiquity or in early Christianity in Augustine and I work on cosmology. Now let me just give a quick um, redefinition to what you think of probably when you hear cosmology because any uh, modern uh, scientists, and especially a physicist, as we have a physicist, at least one physicist in the room, will think of cosmology as being something akin to astronomy. Uh, cosmology in the ancient world was a philosophical approach to understand the nature of the cosmos. What are the underlying metaphysical principles and structures that help us understand the world as we know it? So when I talk about cosmology, I'm not, doing, I'm not talking about astronomy. Uh, we're talking about the underlying conceptual structure, how we understand the world, how it works. So with that, let's begin. I should just ask, how many of you have uh, read Augustine's works? Any of Augustine's works? Where are we Confessions? On Christian doctrine or, or Christian instruction or Christian teaching, it has different titles. Good. Uh, uh, the City of God, all of it. <laughs> Sorry, that was just being that was just being rude. Um, the uh, uh, how about his literal commentary on Genesis? Oh, okay, impressive. One of you have. Uh, it, had you lived at the time of uh, in the 14th century, it's probably one of the more likely texts you would have read of Augustine. Now it's one of the least known. Uh, and yet, in its time, it has been one of the most influential, and certainly, and that's part of the reason for uh, engaging with it, it was one of the influential texts at the time of, uh, on the cusp of early modern scientific developments, or natural philosophy, and very much influential in, for Newton, Galileo, and others. And so it's an important text in thinking through the development of the history of science. 
Second definition I should give. So I've said when I'm talking about cosmology, please understand when I talk about science, I'm using very much a modern term. So the, word, the idea of defining science or, and, and even religion are terms of the 19th century. So when we talk about science and religion, or science versus religion in whatever form, we're ta it's, a, it's a bit of an artificial construction, and an artificial construal to try and describe ways of perceiving and thinking and working with materials for whether it be 1,000 years ago or 1,500 years ago in my period, or if you go back 2,000 and 2,500 years ago into the ancient Near East, it's a false kind of definition. It's an easy one, and it's a natural one now to use, but the term, for example, in late antiquity on through up until uh, the middle part of the 19th century would have been natural philosophy, not science to use for describing the world. So please bear that, that definition in mind, but I'm gonna go with the easy and normal one that most people recognize in science and religion, but know what I'm actually talking about. So, Augustine of Hippo. Uh, this is a uh, fresco of Augustine from the late sixth century. It's not his actual image. Some people think it came from his signet ring, so possible the visage, the image of his face came from his own signet ring, but that's a guesswork. It's an interesting one, but it gives you a feel of what a late antique bishop would have looked like sitting in his cathedra. And I was able to go in and see that. It's a very fun, here you can see me standing in awe, having just gone on my pilgrimage. Uh, it's, it, it's located underneath the Scala Sancta, which is the church across from the Lateran Cathedral in Rome. And it's an archeological dig. I had to get special permission from the, Arch, uh, from the Archbishop who oversees the Vatican Museum and Library uh, had to give me permission to go down into that. And so it was really was a great opportunity to go see something that's rarely seen um, in reality, but Augustine, uh, author, uh, one, of the, one of the most uh, extensive authors of, uh, of the West, uh, one of the most expansive authors, uh, delivering uh, somewhere, uh, ra well, right at 93 books available of 94. Sometimes you see 120 books listed. That's because some of his letters were so long, people treated them as books. <laughs> um, I'm going with what he intended them to be. Authorial intent is critical. So if he intended it as a letter, I call it a letter. So 94 books, 93 of those still extant. That's an amazing data set to have. And even more amazing for my area of interest is we still have almost 1,000 of his sermons available in some form. And those are fascinating pieces of that. But he probably gave somewhere between, depending on, on who's counting and how they're counting, somewhere between four and 10,000 sermons in his lifetime. Uh, so an amazing set of materials to work with. Now when you think of Augustine, maybe some of you think of an image something like this. There's the, this is Botticelli's, you know, there's the passion of Augustine. This is the Augustine of the confessions, that deep sense of spirit and spirituality, uh, spiritual engagement. That's a, perhaps a common image. Um, some of you might think of this, other painting of Botticelli's. This one's Augustine. What's he doing? Can you see, the, is the light okay? Can you see it? What's he, that's a book he's writing. So maybe what, some of you think of Augustine when uh, you think of him as writing books, just as you saw from that earlier list a moment ago, that wouldn't be bad. Or maybe some of you, perhaps especially at a school uh, in the Nazarene and Wesleyan tradition might think of Augustine like this, here he is the hammer of Pelagius, uh, <laughs> taking down anyone who would dare to uphold free will. Uh, this perhaps is the image you have in your mind of Augustine, don't know. Here's uh, the image that's probably the closest available, as we've already, I already mentioned. Uh, gives us the greatest access. Here's the one I want you to think about. Seriously, though, this is my favorite image of Augustine. Uh, I came at this uh, while I was dissertating, writing on Augustine's commentary in Genesis uh, long ago. And uh, I, those in the room who have done doctorates know that it's the long, dark night of the soul. And you need anything possible to encourage you and cheer you up in those moments. So I had this printed quite large and, and posted up over my desk as I was working. Uh, and it's really interesting. This is the image of what a 15th, early 16th century bishop would have looked like, or what, what they envisioned him. This is, this is a rhetorical uh, painting, of course. So it's not that everyone looked like this, and that's not even his face. That's the current cardinal at the time in Florence. Um, that was very typical the patron of the painter, sorry, the cardinal in Venice where it's located. But if you look at this image, there's some really interesting pieces here. Let me get out of the way for others to see it. So if you look in there, in this cabinet, anyone recognize these instruments? 
Those are astrolabes. So those were the uh, medieval development for tracking the light of the stars and for coordinates. So they were critical to navigation. Um, if you look down there, you can't quite see what it is easily, but that's a nocturnal for charting the nighttime sky. There is a, sand, a timepiece, a sand clock. Uh, again, you can't see it very well in this light. Um, who knows what that is? That image there, can you tell what that is? That's an armillary sphere, which was invented by Ptolemy in the second century to describe uh, and chart the heavens. So here you have all these images of, that have to do with the natural world surrounding him. And this is a, it's an interesting presentation of Augustine in the 15th century. Remember I said, what was his most influential book in the, one of the most influential books in the lead up to early modern science? His commentaries on Genesis, and particularly his literal commentary. And here you can see some of the implications of that. These are not things that somebody would pre present probably for Augustine if you saw a modern image. The, or think about it, this is what they thought a learned bishop would have around him. <laughs> How many of us think about our learned bishops um, being surrounded by such materials today. Um, I'll give that to the dean of the School of Theology to think about how he presents uh, Azusa's theology. Well, I'm a historian, so context counts, so let me just give you some of the core dates around him or key moments that shape and come into Augustine. So born in, uh, to, uh, Augustine was born in 354 and died in 430. So coming before him, in the, the third century was a period of great chaos in Roman society. Roman world, that period right there, from 235 to 270 AD, 35 years, 70 emperors, only one of whom died of natural causes. One long civil war. The, emperor, the, the generals kept crossing the Rubicon, the Rubicon's that river in the north of Italy that no, German, sorry, that no general could cross without uh, being, causing civil war, unless it was just with their guard and their advisors. So crossing with their troops over and over, they crossed the Rubicon and won long civil war. Uh, at the end of that, you have Diocletian restructuring the empire, and that's how we get east and west. So Diocletian brings administrative coherence to what was a very incoherent, massive empire, uh, hard to control, and he restructures. That's how we have this historic east-west division to this day. So you think about the Byzantine East and the Latin West. Uh, we think about East and West in terms of politics. That structure still fills our imagination and shapes the way we think about the world around us. The uh, Diocletian lasted, and he actually did the unthinkable. He retired, <laughs> went to Nicomedia, the Dalmatian coast, and uh, uh, another civil war broke out yet again. Romans were really good at that. Several things they were good at. One of them was civil war. Uh, engineering, doing, doing religious rites, those were all within their strong suit. In the midst of this, this young upstart then marches on Rome, the son of one of the, uh, the co-Augusti, uh, Constantine, comes out of York and wins a victory he shouldn't win. And that changes, the, this, this world is critical to understanding how Augustine deals with Genesis. So I'm, it's, I'm not just doing some deep history, because I'm a historian, I think you should all know it, though that's true. Um, <laughs> but I actually, it's relevant to understanding this context because culture is so profoundly determined on the way the church identifies itself in the world and the way we shape. You think about it, spirituality is always culturally shaped, culturally determined. Our culture shapes the way we think about the world and reality around us. And civil war changes a culture. We know this over and over again. I often find myself wrestling with our leaders, our political leaders, who may or may not say something about the financial impact of going to war, often may not, may or may not talk about the, the, the impact on, of the life of the troops, but I've never heard a political leader talk about the impact of a culture of going to war. But war changes a culture. You think about that in a lot of different ways. I couldn't imagine the visceral, bitter attitude towards migration immigrants that we find today in America were it not for the war stance taken in after uh, the two towers in 9-11. It just changed the way America thought about itself in the world and changed the way we react to the rest of the world around us. The war changes people. It changes the way they engage. And this did the same thing to Rome, this period. And so Augustine, and this was also a period of some of the great persecutions. If you were to read 
uh, the church history by Eusebius that often many people know of or read. Anyone have read Eusebius' church history? Okay. He'll talk about these 10 great persecutions and talk about it as a very specific, determined, anti-Christian stance. No. When you're in a civil war and you're an emperor who has just killed the person who came before you, and you've seen a chain of that, and you're worried about yourself, what's the first thing you do? You impose a political loyalty oath. And that's what the emperors did. They imposed a political slash loyalty oath. But in the ancient world, politics and religion were two sides of the same coin, completely, completely connected. You can't take one against, without the other. So in imposing a political oath, a loyalty oath, it was also a religious test. You can't separate the two. And so they were set to worship. They, they demonstrated their loyalty by worshiping the genus of the emperor, which was a, form of, uh, it was a minor form of religious paganism. Well, the Christians wouldn't do that. And so they got persecuted. Not, if you will, because they were Christians, but because they failed to demonstrate their loyalty to the emperor in a way that the emperor could recognize it. It is a religious issue, but it's, to just reduce it to a simple form of anti-Christianity would be a, mis a misrepresentation of the world. And those kind of misrepresentations set us up to make other mistakes. So it's really important to be clear about what's going on. And it's into this world, then, where when you begin thinking about challenges, difficulties, problems, where does the problem lie? Well, they very much externalized evil, the world, and difficulties. So who's, who's my enemy? Well, it's the government or the state. Probably they wouldn't really use the gov word government. That's a modern term. It's the state. It's the side. They're the ones who are my enemies. Or in spiritual terms, they often very much externalized it. So spiritually, they would think not in terms of the interior person. We, we're trained now to think about the interior person. We think about the problems of who I am, myself. In the ancient world, in this world of the fourth century, the enemy was exterior, whether it would be the, the state for a Christian or it was the demonic. So uh, if, uh, if you were being tested, if, if you were having bad things happening, it's because you had all these demons attacking you. It's not because there's anything fundamentally wrong internally. It's that there's something fundamentally wrong externally. And this is critical because it really shapes the world that Augustine comes into. Uh, here are some of his own key dates. And so in the world in which Augustine lived, they thought of um, motion, so speaking for the, to the physicists in this moment in particular, thought of motion as being driven by souls or soul beings. You accounted for me celestial mechanics or, um, or, uh, or any kind of mechanics on Earth, that is motion, through the movement of souls. So if something goes wrong physically on Earth, it's because some soul has caused it. If some physical effect has gone badly, it's because of some soul. Ever wonder why the planets in our solar system are named after Roman gods? It's because it represents the notion of ensouled beings. That's how you account for motion. How is it that planet is able to move? Whether you, we understand as it moves now in ellipt as they all, sorry, not it, they, move in ellipses around the sun, but when they thought of them even in, in in the, within the context of the crystalline spheres of the Aristotelian tradition, it was that you had planets move because they were, were in soul beings. Even at one point in his North African congregation, Augustine, in one of his sermons, tells his congregants, don't rename, simply adapt this Roman way of seeing the planets and rename the planets with saints' names. They're apparently calling them not Mars and Venus, but they're going to call them Peter and Paul and John. <laughs> Augustine works to dissuade them of such an approach, such a notion. But that's because they conce the concept is we can account through motion through souls. And that accounts for all motion, the origin of the world through to every activity within the world. And it led to a kind of very formed, hard form of determinism. Nothing could happen unless a soul. And so you could talk about in terms of the divine soul, or multiple divine souls, if you say you're in the ancient Near East, or in Roman society, you have a plethora of gods. And you're often having to work to placate one god and play one god off the other. Whether this is true in the Roman world, the Augustine inhabitants, it's true in the earlier world. 
we are, we are, a, we are challenged by the, the, all these divinities. And these divinities then define the way they thought about the physical world. The problem is something then external. And motion is something that's external. And so what we have is a deeply enchanted world. You saw my title. Augustine is going to move towards the notion of disenchantment. Now, please understand I'm talking about enchantment in a very particular way. Not enchanting as in lovely, interesting, thoughtful, inspiring, even spiritually, having spiritual depth. I'm talking about enchantment in a very technical sense of is there a soul that's the cause of all this. And what is going on behind this? So, um, actually, let me say a few more things, and then I want to uh, talk about the doctrine of the creation out of nothing. So, in the late antique world, it had, happened. You had, the, you had the Platonic tradition that had a sense of the chain of being that connected all of reality, deeply interpermeated. So, you have Plotinus, who is this interpreter of Plato, talking about cosmos being deeply, oh, uh, deeply inter interconnected because you had the original one, the existence, Tahan, overflowing into noose or mind. And it, 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 part of its being overflows. And part of its being then overflows into soul. And part of its being overflows into multitude of souls. And then on into bodies. So you have this sense of a deeply interconnected world where the divine touches everything. But not touching everything in a way that we think about in a Christian sense today of God's involvement. It's the divine actually is a part of the divine spirit that infuses everything. There isn't a distinction, a clear distinction between the world and the divine, whether it be a multitude of divinities or a single divinity. You have the Stoics, who were the great physicists of the ancient world. They were some of the great scientists. And for them, the world was driven by an underlying soul that interconnected and permeated all. It's what made various aspects of Stoic thought work. So for a Stoic, if you saw birds flying in a certain pattern, this is called divination. If you saw birds flying in a certain pattern and track them, and if you know what to look for, you could predict what was going to go on in the battle your general was about to wage. Now why is that? It's because the, the world was so radically interconnected that the birds fly in the same way that the pattern of the battle would go. And it's because of this sense of this deep interconnection. And so on. We can talk about this in a lot of different forces. But in Gnosticism, some of you are biblical scholars in the room, ancient Gnosticism reflects this kind of way of thinking and is reflective of it. And then sometimes you just get ordinary things of ordinary pagans who just, everything is down to the caprice of the gods. So you have a people who are driven by divine beings or semi-divine in different ways. And that shapes the way in which they conceptualize. And it's into this then Augustine comes and he inherits a doctrine. Actually, I want to, let me jump to there and I'll come back. So probably everyone in the room knows the uh, doctrine of creation out of nothing, creatio ex nihilo, yes? Now, I should say Augustine didn't use that phrase. He used a different variant, facio ex nihilo, made out of nothing. Not a big difference, but for a pendant like me, that you want to make sure you be clear. Um, this is an idea that developed in uh, the first century BC within Jewish thought, first within Middle Platonism and, early, and, and Middle Judaism, particularly Philo of Alexandria. That gets picked up in the first century, late first century and into the second century by the Christians and becomes a fundamental doctrine within the church, but not quite fully yet. That is, it becomes a touchstone and used, but actually it takes several centuries before they begin to think through what its implications are. And doc development of doctrine often works that way. We, we make statements, assertions, and think it through, and it has to be tested and developed and refined and reworked over time. Well, at the time, by the time of Augustine, writing about 400, the doctrine of creation out of nothing hadn't really been thought through. It was asserted, it was used, but there wasn't a full excuse me, there wasn't this sense of a full framework, a full structuring of what it meant, what its implications are. And that is what Augustine is doing in these five commentaries on Genesis. He's really working through what are the implications of creation out of nothing? How does this work? How do, what is the nature of it? Uh, how does it impact? And it causes him to rethink the nature of evil, to rethink the, pro, the nature of the imago dei, the image of God. You know, you think about this. When you think about the image of God, there are two basic theological approaches to the Imago Dei. There are variations, but two fundamental options. You can either say people are made with the image, humans are made in the image of God, 
Adam and Eve fell, the image is completely lost. And then Jesus comes and in the redemptive act restores the image, puts it back where it was empty, that was emptied out by the fall. That's one theological tradition. The other approach to that is to say that the image is marred and deeply afflicted, and so deeply afflicted that it needs some, some really massive substantive atonement, a work of God to restore it, but there's still the image there. It's just been marred. And Augustine, in rethinking the, uh, this doctrine of creation out of nothing, and I'm going to be going through this in a few minutes, goes from the first position to the second position. He changes his theology as he's thinking. So you can see how his rethinking of creation out of nothing alters the way he does his core theological reflection. Well, and it's interesting. One of the reasons why I like studying Augustine is he changes his mind on things. I find him really fascinating because he develops, he changes, and it's you can track it. So if you read him closely enough, you can see him changing and tracking. I find that far more interesting than reading someone like Aquinas where you get all the materials, sorry if there's any Thomistic scholars in the room, where you get everything all at once it seems like and you don't get the sense of the development or change, or at least not enough that I'm astute enough to understand. And so for Augustine, you can see these adaptations, these developments, this rethinking going on. And I find that fascinating because I don't know about you, but I'm always rethinking. There's all sorts of positions I held 20 years ago that I wouldn't hold now, can't hold now, um, as, I've, as I've come to understand or see new things. So Augustine becomes very interesting. One of those is the way he thinks about nature about the natural world, and by implication also reason. So let me say a little bit about his cosmology, a little bit about evil. Augustine is preoccupied with Genesis. Those numbers there tell the story. And, and, and there's so many more numbers I could have put up. I just did a few, and I got bored of counting. Um, you know, had I taken, um, uh, had I taken the verses, the various representative text in Psalms. Had I counted the rest of Genesis 1 to 3, those numbers would have really gone up massively. You don't need to see that to get the picture. I didn't need to do that to get the idea. Um, so enough to figure that out. But Genesis played a fundamental role, probably played a fundamental role in Augustine's own conversion out of Manchism. So those of you who've been around Augustine a bit know that um, Augustine grew up with a mother who's a Christian, Monica, father who is a petty pagan official uh, in North Africa, which was the breadbasket of Rome. So it's a bit like place like the, the Midwest to a U.S. in terms of the, the granary of the country. Uh, excuse me. And um, so he grows up in this society that is, um, it is very conservative. They have quite a literalistic interpretation of texts. So for example, they they couldn't understand anthropomorphisms in scripture. And they would imagine that when, in the Psalms, it talks about the right hand of God sweeping away Pharaoh's army, that an arm came down out of heavens. And, I mean, this is like something out of Monty Python and Holy Grail. An arm comes down and sweeps it away because they didn't conceive of anthropomorphisms as, as a way of reflecting the power and work of God. And Augustine, who was a bright young thing, and, and a lot brighter than, uh, than he, he, at least he perceived the people around him, really wrestled with this. And Augustine was preoccupied with two things throughout his life, the problem of evil and the goodness of God. You can see that interplay of those two questions in every single one of his significant works. Um, they just work, they weave their way through. And so the way in which this tradition of interpretation he inherited in North Africa came into presented ultimately a God that he couldn't worship. Think about this. If I were to come into your church and say from the podium, or come into one of your classes, and say evil is some sort of thing, would there be many people reacting negatively to that, reacting? Sounds plausible. But that presents a particular problem, doesn't it? Because if you think of creation out of nothing, if you think of God as creator, where do all things come from? And so where is the ultimate cause of evil? Or what or who is the ultimate cause of evil? God. And Augustine could see this. And it's because of this that he left the Christianity that he was being taught as a late teenager 
entered the, this Gnostic tradition of Manichaeism because it, it gave another, this, this dualistic Gnostic tradition, excuse me, gave a, a very different approach, a rationalized approach that solved, he thought, his problem. And it's when he heard Ambrose preach on Genesis that he learned a new way. That's where he began to see the possibility of allegory and to understand different ways of interpreting a text and help bring him, if you will, back to uh, scriptures and back to the Christian tradition. So it's under, under Ambrose's influence that he, and particularly Genesis, that Augustine converts back to Christianity because it helps him engage the questions in a fundamental way that he wasn't able to before and work out key questions like creation out of nothing. Um, the, uh, re, the world and ourselves, my internal self, as being one that's formed, deformed, and reformed. Formed as creation, deformed as the fall, reformed as, as the atonement, the salvation. And it gives a way for him to reframe his own personal history, universal history, the work of God in time. And it also leads to him rethinking the nature of the world as we know it. So uh, he says this in his literal commentary on Genesis. There are five different commentaries on Genesis 1 to 3. So one is a allegorical commentary written against the Manichees, written soon after he converted. Then he, the, if you've read, some of you have read the Confessions, the last part of the Confessions is a commentary on Genesis. That's Genesis, books 11 to 13. Then he, uh, about that time, he tries a literal commentary on Genesis and fails of his own accord. He writes later on, he didn't even want to publish it, and finally published it, he said, because this way people will understand how he developed, so that's interesting. And uh, writes this, uh, attempted a literal commentary. Then he writes his great commentary that I work with, the De Genesia Literum, the, the, the completed commentary on Genesis. And then the City of God books 11 to 14 are also a commentary on Genesis. So those are the five main uh, five main goes at, although it shows up in a lot in short form in other texts. So, look at this. We must make a threefold distinction in speaking of creation. First, there are the unchangeable forms in the Word of God. Secondly, God's works from which He rested on the seventh day. Finally, the things that He produces from those works even now. Can you recognize Genesis one and two in that? Is that an obvious interpretation of Genesis one to two? No, yes, maybe. What's interesting is we have to also understand what Augustine means by literal. Because by, we use the word literal to mean a certain thing today. So by literal, we mean the, I'm not even quite sure I can give words to what we mean. We use it to be a, uh, Bob, you might need to help me out here, um, a, 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 a obvious uh, speaking of the words as we use them in our right today. Would that be okay? For Augustine, that's not what he, what he meant. Literal, ad literum, means according to the word, and but he means by the word, by the word of the author. In other words, it's authorial intent. So if the author intends you to read something figuratively, a literal reading is a figurative reading. If the author intends it to be allegory, a literal reading is to re interpret it allegorically. So it's paying attention sensit and sensitivity to the intent of the author. So Augustine, and, and in fact, none of the, uh, out of only, out of the 40 authors who wrote on Genesis in the fourth century, I've only found one author who used it in any way sense like a modern literal interpretation uh, to think of seven 24-hour days. That's a, uh, that's a modern notion. Uh, that, that's, a, uh, that's something that has been put upon the text by much later interpreters. So nature and Genesis meant something very different for them. So he thinks in terms of there being three moments. One before the text and two within the text. So the first moment is an underlying plan because he couldn't have God doing something willy-nilly. So God's got an underlying plan, an underlining blueprint, if you will. He doesn't use the word blueprint, that's a modern term. <laughs> but he has a sense of an underlying blueprint that shapes what he would do. Out of that, he then shapes what we would call something like natural causes or natural laws. So he talks about the creation of the eternal rationes, which, which are created by God and lasting, and they shape the ongoing development of creation. And that's what he understands Genesis 1 to reflect. 
Genesis 2, he treats as being the creation of the seminal reasons. These are physiological, based on the natural laws, and they would shape what is done as a result of that. So that for him, you could have, you know, these eternal reasons have always been, but the seminal reasons don't necessarily show themselves right away. Or those can even get reshaped in a way over time. So interestingly, um, after, um, after publication of Origin of Species in 1859, you started to have a number of theologians tried out Augustine either for or against Darwin, depending on how they interpreted these passages. And you got both sides of it. Those, the first article is about 1879, but a whole series of articles over the next 50 years of Augustine upheld Darwin, Augustine rejected Darwin. Well, of course, Augustine didn't know Darwin or engage with Darwinian thought, so it's a bit of a silly conversation we can say in retrospect. Um, but you can, that's how they got at that. So, but what What's important here, don't have to memorize, know that he had these three kinds of causes. What these do is they create really for the first time within Christian thought. Although I say for the first time, first time within the Latin West, about the same time the Cappadocian authors are starting to think through some similar things in the East. Um, this, these would be uh, Gregory of Nyssa and Basil and uh, Gregory of Nancyansis. Um, and then a little bit later on, Maximus the Confessor. Um, but look at where this leads him. This is the interesting thing to note. Where this leads him, that he begins to describe something like a structure of nature. What he's giving us for the first time in our language is a sense of an orderly, structured nature. And that's, that's, we take that for granted. But that's really a surprising evolution of thought that wasn't present before he was writing in this way. And that's what makes this work important. Because look at this, this comment. It is thus that God unfolds the generations which he laid up in creation. That, that creatio there, that he uses the word secula. Um, that'd be something, that's the near a Latin equivalent to cosmos. So he laid up creation when first he found it, and they would not be sent forth to run their courses if few made creatures cease to exercise his provident administration over them. And the sacred writer was an ignorant of nature and order of the elements when he described the creation of visible things that move by nature throughout the universe in the midst of the elements. Now, look at this. This is a surprising statement for this time. Like, pre, you're probably reading thinking, yeah, so, okay. Um, but compared to anyone who's writing before him or the influences he's got. Things that move by nature, that's a definitively different approach than had been taken previously as a clear understanding of the of world. That you begin to get something like what we begin to understand as a natural world where there is a nature that works objectively, that has a structure and has a coherence, not driven by the caprice of the gods, or of particular souls, whether you want to call them gods or not. Not driven by caprice, but according to a structure, a defined plan. And that's really an important statement. Or this one from Literal Interpretation 9. The whole course of nature we're so familiar with has certain natural laws of its own. Um, we're starting to get the language of natural law. This is really an early statement of it. I don't think he's using it fully as it would come to be meant. And, uh, into the later medieval and early modern period, but this is really the early development of the phrase. According to which both the spirit of life, which is the creature, has drives and urges that are somehow predetermined. It's not, when he's talking about spirit of life there, uh, he's, that's a bad translation. Um, it, it, don't think Holy Spirit here. It's, it's a bit of like, and it's not Mother Nature. Um, it is a sense of the vitality of the world operates. It has urges that, somehow, that seem to some, somehow be determined, which, which even a bad will can't bypass. So there's, there's a structure. There's a plan that's put in place that drives the overall nature of reality and, and, and enables it to work. And again, compared to earlier writing, this is really a surprising kind of statement. So. This cosmology provides Augustine with a means for explaining ongoing governance, which just hadn't been present before in the same way, um, for the governance of activity of nature. 
Not all reasons are always evident. Some are only employed for a particular purpose. This also allows him to explain miracles. It, it seems kind of comical now, but he used these to say this is how miracles happen because he couldn't have God breaking his own laws. And so uh, for Augustine, there is a natural law, the, the, a uh, seminal reason for walking on water, if you will, that was there set up to be employed at one time for that purpose and only got revealed at that time. So it allows him to explain miracles because he couldn't have miracles breaking nature. And the miracles don't subordinate nature. They're an additional thing that we haven't seen before. It's, almost, it's more revelatory than alteration, if that makes sense. And it gives him a way then to talk about operations that are maintained by natural causes. Now, he has God as the initial cause, if you will. He doesn't quite use that formative language. But you have God as this initial cause by, as the creator. And he allows for the possibility uh, for, uh, for God's continuing. This is not a blind watchmaker separated from the universe, but it's a universe that has a purpose, a direction, a design. And so it's not driven by caprice. And that's a big change from the world. Now let me say a few things about how evil comes into this. When we, I said earlier that we, for Augustine you couldn't think of evil as some sort of thing. So his conclusion, the only other option is evil is nothing. Nothing is evil. Now, is that a satisfactory way of considering it? Now, there are a few scholars who think that Augustine is doing something like an Eastern religion approach to evil when he says that. But he's not. He's being just a very good philosopher and working through the notion of privation. So for Augustine, as he's thinking through this, God is the maker of all things, makes cre creation out of nothing. Evil is a movement back towards nothingness. It is a corruption or a corrosion. It's an undermining of the quality of a thing that undermines its integrity. But there is, it doesn't move back to being absolute evil. There isn't such a thing as absolute evil, right? Because what would absolute evil be? If something were absolutely evil, given this understanding, how would you otherwise describe it? Oh, for absolute evil? No, not paradise. Perfection. Not even perfection. Uh -huh. Nothing. Bingo. If it's absolute evil, it's nothing. And that's, so you're not talking about anything. So for Augustine, evil is this undermining of the integrity thing. This will be tying this in to, closely to his cosmology in just a moment, as he did. And this explains then how, what we contend with in the world around us. We are constantly dealing with evil things myself, because I'm dealing with something that has been corroded or corrupted. It's like my bicycle. I have, well, I've, I really enjoy cycling. That's my key sport. Um, uh, and uh, I've had multiple bicycles stolen in Oxford, so now I keep a really, really old, bad, I hate this bicycle, <laughs> bicycle in my back, in the, at my office, which I, when I, when I ride into, like I go run a graduate seminar at Christ Church, that's what I write in. It's, I bought it for 10 pounds. Um, the chain is utterly horrible. Every time I, I turn it, I hear it squeak, and I think, and also I'm a bike mechanic. I know how to fix this up, but I don't, because I don't want somebody to think it looks good or sounds good. Um, and so I, bought, I cycle this 10-pound bike into, the, into town whenever I need to go into town for my office, because I don't want my good bike stolen again. The thing about it is, that bike that is so rusted, is still usable. It still has a vitality, a viability to it. Evil doesn't destroy it. It's not destroyed, it's corroded. It's corrupted. It's lost some of its proper existence. Its quality is undermined. So as bad as that bike is, and as much as I truly hate riding it, and I cannot say this strongly enough, how much I hate riding this bike, the only thing that keeps me going is, well, if it gets stolen, I don't care. <laughs> um, oh, well, actually, I came out of Christ Church one day and found someone trying to steal it. <laughs> what? <laughs> but that's another story. Don't be dissuaded to come to study with us in Oxford because of that. <laughs> it's still a great place to be. Um, the, uh, it's a little bit like, so I've got postcards here on 
come study with us in Skio for the uh, study abroad program. It's a little bit like, I have to apologize to Jonathan Kirkpatrick who took this photo. It's like if I asked you to come, come study with us in Oxford and gave you that. What have you got? What's that? Can you do anything with it? If I, if I, I'm extending the invitation to you, in fact. Come study with us in Oxford. And uh, I've just given you that. What can you do? So you have to do some work. And that, for Augustine, explains the problem of evil. Evil undermines the integrity. It alters the reality. But there's still something viable there. There's still a degree of goodness left. As long as there's something existing, there's still a degree of something viable there to work with. And that, uh, for those of you who've read The City of God or know The City of God, that defines how he understands the nature of the state. Or if, as you work with, through his semiotics and language and interpretation in, on Christian instruction or Christian doctrine, that defines how he understands the problem of interpretation. That we live in this corroded, corrupted life. We're affected by it. We're afflicted by it, but it doesn't mean all is lost. It means it's all affected, and it means we've got to work a whole lot harder, and we have to do other work. And, we, and it also means, while that doesn't give certitude, certitude and that, to, that psychological state is important to Augustine, it doesn't give certitude. You can't, be, you can't look at that and say, okay, I know what it's all about, that little scrap I've given her. But you can get a picture of it. And with that picture, you could then perhaps develop it into something more. And that's what Augustine understands the nature of the world about us to be. And also the Imago Dei. Remember I said at the beginning that he changed his stance on the Imago Dei. The image of God isn't lost, it's corrupted, it's privated. Provatio boni is the key word here. And so for Augustine, Augustine's a, a good philosopher by his own, in his own day. Augustine comes to the conclusion that anything that's made also is going to decay. To be made out of nothing means it doesn't have absolute essential existence. Only God has absolute essential existence. So if something is made, it's going to naturally decay. It's, it's necessary, otherwise God is making himself. And that's a foolish opinion, a, a, a silly stance to take. So from the standpoint of thinking about the world, we understand the world to be made, and it has a possibility of decaying. Now, privation for Augustine is not the same as decay. It's not corruption. Decay does not equal corruption. Corruption is, for Augustine, a spiritual description of reality. Decay is a physiological description of reality, or, or, or parts, different parts of reality, rather. So things decay if they're made. <clears throat> decay is going to happen. So you don't have to take the position, as some have, with a, in an Augustinian tradition, that there can't be any decay before the fall, so therefore you have to come up with an explanation so, for how the grass could never turn brown before a fall, or how trees can brown and fall, or how there could be volcanoes, or physiolo physiological cataclysm in the earth that decay and change are a part of any created thing that God would make. Privation is another matter. Privation for him is something that comes in secondarily, and it's, it's a description of a distortion of the soul, corruption of the soul. And so he keeps very clear distinction here. And this is really important for understanding because it's been many who have confused it, and, it's, and for some it's really gotten in the way of them thinking through issues seriously in terms of science religion. They, say, they think, okay, I, I, I'm shaped by this tra theological tradition that says I can't accept um, any kind of, of violence or decay in the world outside of a fall. And that's because there's a confusion of what some earlier tradition has said about that that is confusing decay and privation. Now, there might, you might come back reason that position for another reason, but don't do it for this reason. That is, this, this doesn't support you. Uh, the Augustinian tradition doesn't support such a view. So, privatio boni, privation of the good, deeply shapes Augustine's thought. This shows up, many modern authors pick this up, right? Some of you, it shows up in literature. 
Anyone ever read Tolkien? Where do orcs come from? Orcs are, someone knows, twisted elves, right? They're elves that are decayed, corrupted. Think about how important the language of corruption is to Tolkien. Lewis picks this up. T.S. Eliot, you see that throughout some of the great 19th century authors. This is understood in many circles, literary circles. And it's shown up in different the uh, theological circles. So evil is the removal of a good. And we get this corrupted nature, but it doesn't mean, because my corrupted nature, my nature is corrupted, it doesn't mean I'm entirely bad. Because if I were entirely bad, there would be nothing left. There is a degree of goodness there. Now it doesn't mean, this, uh, this is not saying that humans are essentially good, but nor is it saying we're essentially evil. There's a state in between. And that's what Christ then redeems. Now that, that, that amount that's left still needs Christ's intervention, to be sure. But you don't have to therefore say that somebody has, you, you see the philanthropist who does a good thing. Um, I have no idea their spiritual state, so I'm not commenting on that. But you take it some, look at something like Gates Foundation, and Gates doing amazing things to, uh, uh, in Africa with regard to malaria. And uh, now he's uh, trying to change the way toilets are built. And you know, just amazing things. Whatever, I have no idea. I don't know his soul, so I'm not coming. But let's just presume that he has no spiritual relationship with Christ. I don't have to look at that to affirm that that's a good thing. Because a person can do a good thing, just as my bicycle can get me, my, my, my not so great bicycle can get me somewhere. A person, a not so great person can do good things. So we don't have to try and figure out well, their spiritual state. We can just acknowledge as humans there is, a, there is part of the Imago Dei there that can affect substantive real good. And we can affirm that, even without, work, without stepping onto that next step. Uh, here's just a text from Confession 7. Books 5 to 7 of the Confessions really dig deeply into this and explain his whole problem with the, how he's engaged with the problem of evil. So it's made clear to me that all things are good, even if they're corrupted. They couldn't be corrupted if they were supremely good. That's only God. But unless they're good, they could not be corrupted. If they were supremely good, they would be incorruptible. If they were not good at all, there would be nothing in them to be corrupted. For corruption harms, but unless it could diminish goodness, it could not harm. But then notice this next statement as I try and explain the difference between decay and privation. Therefore, when as a result of the deficiency of being, things decay, either they have not received any further being and it's not their fault, in the same way there's no fault while they exist, they receive no further being, or else they refuse to be what they have the power to be when they chose. So what they might have possessed is good, they're guilty if they refuse it. So it's the issue of moral choice here. That's where we understand it. So let me just bring this to a close. Augustine presents, I think really for the first time in, any, in a complex, more structured way, I, what we would begin to understand as a natural world. Now that plays an important part and becomes really influential for the development of the history of science. I'm not saying there would be no further history of science. You wouldn't have Galileo and Newton uh, and Boyle and others without Augustine, and yet he was clearly a fundamental influence upon them and played a role. And so in terms of understanding the history, the story of the development of science, this is one of those valuable stepping stones. Might have happened another way, but it did happen this way. Um, I, so I'm not asserting you wouldn't have modern science without Augustine. I am saying he's played a valuable influential role. And there's other aspects in terms of the development of thinking in the 18th century that uh, my former colleague Peter Harrison has written about. But I'll leave that one for another time. Critically, he has expressed a view of the cosmos where it is a, there's a clear basis for distinguishing the creator from the creation. That you have a disenchanted nature, a nature that is contingent, it's finite, it's separate from the creator, and that creates a, the basis for understanding his work. Importantly here, sin doesn't destroy reason. This plays, perhaps you're seeing this as a result of the text I was giving you. It afflicts reason, just like it afflicts that postcard, but it doesn't destroy it. 
it becomes, this becomes the first argu sustained argument for natural reason as well in that way. So in the second century, you had some of the Christian theologians trying to figure out how is it the Greeks know a few things that we appreciate and value and agree with. And you had a number of different things, but at the end of the day, they came down to theft. That the Greeks, um, they would say, well, Plato uh, spent some time in Egypt. Who else was in Egypt before him? Moses. <laughs> and so, he, and the, uh, the uh, tablets were hidden there, perhaps by Jeremiah, uh, after the collapse of Jerusalem. And so therefore, the Greeks knew what they knew because they stole it from the Hebrew scriptures. Well, that's not a very <laughs> satisfactory approach and one that's highly problematic on a lot of levels. But that was how they could explain why there were others out there who had ideas that agreed with ours. Augustine is beginning to give a basis for understanding reason having a broader, more coherent, more effervescent basis in reality that transcends the particulars. So sin doesn't destroy it, though it does taint it, and we get up to loss of certitude. Along with that, then, human institutions, whether it be culture, government, arts, language, figure, you know, fill in the blank. All of this is affected, but it also has a value still. So this becomes, I think, the strongest reason to be thinking about from a, a theology of culture, how you and why you, and, and, and the basis in which you engage in cultural activity and to understand the value of particular culture, even as one might critique uh, aspects of it. So it affects human institutions, it helps culture. And he has moved then critically away from treating nature as an organism, driven solely moment by moment the choice of, by the choices of God or the gods. You don't have to have a, otherwise you end up with a very hard determinism that is, the gods drive everything, a kind of form of fatalism. A couple of impact points and then over questions. It's out of this that he develops the language of two books. So you've perhaps heard the two books analogy, the book of nature and the book of scripture. Well, it's Augustine who coins that phrase, uh, and it's in the context of this kind of reflection. And as I've already told you, in the end of the 12th century, this became a critically important discussion. Sometimes we're to, a history of thought will describe the 12th century as the discovery of, na of the natural world, the discovery of nature. I think really more, in, 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 there's a 12th century renaissance that goes on. Fundamentally, it's a, there's a reconfiguring of Augustine in that time under the influence of Thomas and others. And I think we have to say it's more of a reacquiring of a theology of nature than a discovery of a theology of nature. And it becomes very important, as I've said. I mean, look at the, the citation list here. Bonaventure citing uh, Augustine, um, uh, sorry, citing the uh, literal commentary in Genesis almost as much as he cites the city of God and widely read and copied. Uh, it's interesting, you can, one of the ways that the story, and you track this, is how many, how many copies in a given period can you find of a specific text? And so the number of copies of, uh, that we have in our possession of the little comic genesis from this period of the 13th to 15th century is really substantial. That indicates something about how influential and how widely read it was. It even shows up in some interesting artwork. So you guys all know this painting, right? Everyone knows. How many times has Azusa used this in some form of marketing? <laughs> um, so the famous painting by uh, uh, Raphael of the School of Athens. You, has anyone ever seen it in situ, been through the Vatican and seen the Raphael rooms? A few of you, okay. So you go in there and you see this, this is amazing painting. It's, it, it's a room um, about one and a half times as long as this, not quite as deep, and more than twice as high. And this painting takes up the upper register of one whole wall, so it's probably 50 feet by 15 feet maybe or something. Uh, and that's really interesting. And again, it gets used extensively. But if you turn around and look the other way, on the opposite wall is this painting, the, disputa, uh, the dispute on the sacrament. And here's uh, this, by the way, is Augustine. Here's Augustine, and his, he's got the city of God there on the floor in front of him. Um, and this is really interesting. This picks up this two books analogy. So on one wall, and this is Raphael painting in the Vatican, you have on one wall, a very, if you will, quote-unquote, secular education painting of 
Plato, so you've got the Stoics, you've got Plato, you've got Plotinus in there, you've got Aristotle, uh, uh, Socrates. You know, here you've got classical education on one wall, and on the wall right across from it is the, a great theological subject. And that has that sense of the two books, that both of them are part of the world in which we inhabit and live within and take our sensibilities from. One final afterword. You have probably heard it said that the medievals thought the world was flat. Yes? Who's heard, how many of you have heard that statement made? Yeah. Well, if you look at any medieval artwork, you know what you discover? What does that look like? Christ is sitting astride a globe, a sphere. There, that's that painting. This is, uh, these are from Ravenna, great fifth century artwork. Uh, there's the top of a baptistry. What do you see? Spheres. What was the perfect structure for the Greeks and the Romans? A sphere. Would they think of the earth as flat? It goes against, A, it goes against every bit of information we have, and B, it goes against every concept that they held. Do you know where that comes from? Now, were there, were there some individual people who held such a notion? Probably, just like there's people today that who think the Earth is flat. Wasn't there a guy here in California who tried to launch a rocket to demonstrate the world was flat? So you, you get kooks wherever you are, in whatever time period you live in. Um, but that wasn't the main position. So where did that come from? Well, it came from two authors in particular who, uh, and a poet. The authors, perhaps some of you know of Draper and White, who wrote the books that helped create the conflict thesis, the idea that there's an eternal conflict between religions and science, 19th century authors. Um, they presented such a position because that fed their ideology. And Washington Irving, famous for the poet. What did he write? English majors in a room? Legend of Sleepy Hollow? So. Uh, one of his poems presents the flat earth, and he perpetuated idea of the medievals having a flat earth. And that comes into a popular culture, but it has nothing to do with the world we're talking about. Just put that one behind you. So uh, you, you, you can laugh at that. There, I'm just going to leave up is a great statement from Augustine. It sometimes gets quoted in various texts on um, wishing that churchmen were more careful about what they had to say about the natural world because if they misrepresent it and they are found to be wrong, how would people turn to them for confidence in scripture about the, about the state of their soul if they have first learned to distrust them on their descriptions about the world? And so basically urging that churchmen be more careful and cautious about what they have to say about the physical world, lest they, the very people that they should be attempting to reach for another purpose turn their heads and turn away. And that's a really interesting text worth thinking about. Why well, I leave it there and we can do some questions. So please. Thank you. Just a, a, a clarification in relation to um, the concept of decay and corruption as mm. being different in um, Augustine. Uh, how then does he understand physical death? Would that be in the decay or the corruption? Or uh, how, how is that uh, understood by, by Augustine? Yeah. Um, so you have to say, a further piece I have to give to help explain that is Augustine believed that um, in the garden, humans were made, and they uh, were placed, and um, they were created decayable. They, so the um, perfection, it's important to understand in terms of Latin, the language of perfection doesn't mean no change possible. It means the, or it does, doesn't mean that um, the whole end is complete. It's just that there isn't a, uh, a particular lack. Um, and so he understands them to have been made and made decayable. And had they honored the uh, command, then a further grace would have been added that would have changed them 
and he's interpreting the tree of life as being this example of them of offering something that would have a sustaining power. So they would have been sustained through a divine act. And what was lost them, they weren't made mortal by the fall, if you will. They were already mortal. They lost the ability to be immortal as God designed. And so death and decay is part of human experience. So you get almost a kind of failure to launch. That is, had Adam and Eve obeyed the command, they would have received a special additional grace that would have sustained and changed their nature into one that could be sustained. Does that answer your yeah, question? Yeah, I just want to draw, draw it a little bit further. So, like, for instance, when uh, Paul brings out in Romans that um, sin brought about death and death spread to all persons because of the one person. Hmm. And from what I've heard, it, uh, Augustine holds to a, a seminal viewpoint on that. Maybe I just need some clarification on what seminal is, too. It, you, you, you touched on it, but I, I didn't expand on it. Yeah, I, I, I went over that quite quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, he's in, Augustine is understanding death fundamentally there as a separation from God. Um, and, in, and interpreting Paul within this sense that, of separation from God. But that, the irony of that separation, which is self-induced, uh, or self-afflicted, self-inflicted, Self-inflicted? It's the word, isn't it? Sorry. It's a self-inflicted wound. That also leads to a physiological death because of that separation. And so there's a nuance there in terms of how he's interpreting Paul, that there is a, a spiritual death, and that spiritual death um, has then the carry-on impact into physiological. Does that... In short form, trying to answer things quickly, I realize that's not a full satisfactory. All right, now I get some students asking questions. So after you, I assume you're not a student. I'm a faculty member. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you for your presentation. A uh, follow-up question on that. Would it be fair to say, in trying to make the link between Augustine's theology and modern physics, would it be fair to say that Augustine is proposing that entropy is written into the universe from the outset. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I didn't use that because that would be a, uh, when does the language of entropy enter into our lexicon? 1800s, 18th, I think. 19th, okay, uh, I was gonna say 18th and 19th century. So I didn't use that because that would have been entering a modern term that isn't there and yet conceptually. I so think you want to avoid the anachronism of imputing that back to Augustine, but it, it seems like a fairly good match that he... Yeah, it does. And, yeah. and I, I have said it sometimes in other places and then kind of felt like, well, now I'm telling people that Augustine taught entropy and uh, it's not exactly what he's doing, but it's, there, is, there is such a strong conceptual link between the two that I think it's... Reasonable. And so if... if entropy or the entropic is it's not evil itself because that was part of the original design as Augustine sees it then would we have to understand evil as simply accelerating that entropy and that move towards chaos or you know if you said something about or, or that privation was was an eventual result of the decay Right, so it, it seems to me that decay would then lead to my being being less than it ought to be as a human being, right? I, I lose some, but I was already supposed to lose some in the original design. It just, it seems that maybe the way Augustine is conceptualizing it, to use our modern physical terms, maybe God himself would put more energy into the system if we, if we freely go ask him you know, to, to create more order he will do so, and so he, he will kind of top me off, so to speak, right? <laughs> this is why I don't use entropy in a way of describing Augustine. And so so uh. in that sort of scenario, what is the actual nature of, of evil as we experience it? I, I understand that it's a private, he doesn't believe that it's a thing, it's simply a lack, but existentially we, we experience what it feels like to be less, less yeah. than we're supposed to be. So it's a quality that still has a massive impact. Um, so it's not its own essay, its own particular um, concrete existence. Um, it is a quality. So in this way, I mean, 
even the most evil thing you can conceive of, and I assume for most of us in this room that would be Satan, still has a degree of goodness because he still has a degree of existence. So it does tie, it does connect to existence, but, but he is trying to keep a, a distinction because one of the things that he is really reacting against is the Gnostic uh, uh, transmutal of the physical world into a place of evil and treatment of it, and he's rejecting that. that because ultimately then God is the, as the, uh, as the Gnostics saw, God is at fault. Now in their case it was the bad gods were at fault, uh, but nonetheless you have the divine or semi-divine being causing, causing the fault, um, being ultimately responsible, and he's just got to separate from that completely. So it goes back to this uh, way I was trying to describe it just a moment ago that he does think, he mentions this one place in the city of God, I'm sorry, I can't remember uh, I think it's book 14, but I can't remember the exact location now. Uh, he mentioned, he, he just makes this offhand comment that explains a whole lot of his thinking. But it's a bit of an offhand comment, so I do have to say I should be careful on how far I push it. But it says this gives a sense of him saying, had Adam and Eve persisted in humility and grace, they would have been given an additional grace that would have... Um, that would have, but he doesn't say actually it would have perfected him then for all time. So there is a sense of perhaps, you know, had, had they stayed in the grace, maybe you want to describe it in a, in a more um, uh, descriptive sense of had they, they would have been able to continue eating the fruit of the tree of life. But there would have been this continual re revivifying possible. Um, but without that, if, so so the, the moral degradation perpetuates or extends or, or speeds up the decay. I remember reading um, in high school about, um, I was going through a lot of like the Christian history. So I was required to read the Westminster Catechism. And I remember there was a chapter or at least a, like a commentary on it or something. And they were talking about how um, Satan is completely corrupted or like he is completely evil and uh, I'm just wondering how how does that um, compare to Augustine's like how does yeah so Augustine would not admit him to being completely corrupted he would say he is the most corrupted and he is profoundly corrupted and you know so deeply so so much so that you you can't find any you yourself can't find any good but the fact that he's still existing and still able to be used for divine purposes means that there is some degree of good left. So, you know, think about the scriptural mandate that what, what Satan intended for evil in the cross, God intended for good. So God was able to use Satan as one of his tools to accomplish God's purposes in the world. That is only possible if there's a degree of good. You know, micro... Microcosm, micro, microcosmic, is that the word? No. Um, microscopic, uh, you know, it's tiniest bit, but there's still something there. Now, the most corrupted of beings, you could say, but he would not agree with, uh, with Westminster. I don't remember that statement, so I, uh, but if Westminster posed it, uh, the catechism posed it as uh, entirely corrupted, Augustine would disagree with that. That would not be an Augustinian approach. That, yeah. um, that, I mean, I have one more question. So can, um, sure. could we say, like, um, Satan doesn't have any good, like, is there anything left in his nature that's good? Because it sounds like what you said, God uses him for good, so there's some kind of, like, divine intervention that actually utilizes whatever he does for good, rather than, well, rather than, like, it coming, like, the, rather than it just coming from his nature, if so. Yeah. Um, I think he would pose a, a, uh, Satan's uh, purposes being fully, thoroughly corrupted, um, but, but not absolutely so, and that's why it's still viable. He could, um, you know, it, when evil accomplishes, when evil things, so we don't, we don't really talk about evil in abstraction, we talk about things that are corrupted, so we talk about evil things. Um, or we should in terms of this kind of conversation, uh, this sort of set of definitions. 
evil things are able to accomplish some of the greatest evil through um, order and structure. And for Augustine, those are divine gifts, order and structure. Think about um, anyone who studied the history of Nazism can see how the National Socialists created a tremendous machine. They were extremely effective. And they accomplished an awful lot of bad through that machine. But it's the ability to be, a, to, to conceptualize and structure and act as a machine, which is part of their, the created good that enables that. So even in the accomplishment of great evil, it depends on a good thing. It's, the, it's a horrible abuse of it, a misuse of it. But there's still something there that's left. Now, there's an essential assumption that Augustine has made that you can critique. And let me just say as I'm presenting this, I find this is a helpful way to think about the world. This, this has shaped much of what I do to engage and think about the world and the choices I make. And it affects the way I think about vocation and multiple other pieces. But it's one way of thinking. So I, you know, I give this to you for your evaluation and decide whether you, know, you find this equally to be a useful tool or maybe not. You may evaluate and find it really wanting or some degree there, but that's, you know, just evaluate it and that's the good thing. Um, but there's an essential assumption that one that Augustine makes that is a critiquable assumption. And that's that existence, by definition, is a good thing. Because all existence comes from God. If God, because God has brought existence into being, therefore the very fact of existence has a degree of good attached to it. And the, the more existent, fully existent the thing is, the greater that goodness will be reflected. Now, that goodness in the case of an extremely evil being has been so compressed down, so torn apart, that it's hard to recognize it. And there isn't anything there you particularly want to affirm. Nonetheless, there is an intellectual affirmation one has to make. Otherwise, there are significant ramifications to the broader theological commitments, one thinks. Like, where, where does evil come from? Is God responsible? And so this piece of the definition is important, not so much for how we think about Satan or other demonic, but because precisely it shapes how we think about God as creator. And so it's important for the other pieces of the picture that it reflects. Does that make sense? Sure. It looked like you passed by some slides very quickly. Well, I just wonder if you can bring it into currently what's going on in the world and to me just some of this horrific um, evil um, and wondering if there is something beyond perversion. How would he talk about what's happening today? And I don't know. Just... I mean, I, I find this as a system that helps me explain why I find this a useful system is it helps me explain so many different parts of reality. It has, you know, the, 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 the technical term one could use for that is consilience. Uh, it, it has the ability to explain multiple phenomena in culture and in politics and in language. And you can see the way in which cultures can get corrupted and they lose their vitality. And so for me, I'm a dual national of the UK and the US, which means I voted in two unhappy elections three years ago. I was equally dissatisfied with both outcomes. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm putting my political cards on the table there. Um, I, but you can see in ways in which, uh, for Augustine, like, to put this in political language, when Augustine talks about the two cities, this, the, these, city, these are ultimate eschatological realities. So the city of God is nowhere that one can point to at a given moment and say, this is the city of God. Because the city of God is the place where the perfect will of God is being followed. Is it being followed perfectly in my life? You're saying, no, you don't even know me, but you know enough, you know enough about me, apparently. <laughs> and there are a whole lot of people, including myself, which would agree with you. Equally, the city of man is the place that is completely disregarded and upturned the will of God. Is there any place one could point to, as much as you might despise it, where you could say that was ultimately and absolutely the city of man? So these are eschatological terms. 
And for Augustine, we live in the sacrum, which is this mixed inner, this mixed reality of this world in between. We live in the, we, we don't live with black and white. We live in this gray, uncertain world. I want my uh, mentor, I, I had the privilege to study with two of the great Augustine scholars of the last century. Um, uh, Robert Marcus and Gerald Bonner were my two mentors, and they were in, in, in my circles. I, I was really, I, I've been really blessed. Um, and Robert once said to me, and I rejected this for about three days or a week or something. It took me a while to figure this out, to think it through. But he once said to me that Augustine was the apologist for the mediocre Christian life. Mediocrity is enough. And I'm, and I'm here thinking, what are you talking about? <laughs> I didn't storm out of there, but I just thought, no. But more I read Augustine and more I thought about it, I thought, that captures Augustine. Because what you find in Augustine is he fights perfectionism wherever he fights it at every single turn. So in his earliest debates with the Manichees, the Gnostics created a perfect conceptual structure of reality. It was a cosmological perfectionism. And he rejected that. Then, in his debates later on with the Donatists over the nature of the church and of the sacraments and the liturgy, he rejected institutional perfectionism. So the Donatists had said that, you know, any one sin by a priest was enough to throw out the whole church. The, the church itself had no place left. And he said, you know, it doesn't depend on the will of the, the priest. It depends on the love of God. So he, he rejects the institutional perfectionism. And then he does it with language in the Christian instruction. He, re, he rejects that there is a perfect human language. Even the language of Scripture is not perfect because it's human language. These are symbols he describes in one place. In one of his sermons, he says, I have a thought I want to convey to you. In my mind, I have these ideas, and I look for the best carriers to convey those thoughts. This is why, why uh, Derrida and Foucault really liked Augustine. In my mind, I have these thoughts that I want to convey to you. But you may not hear these carriers, these thoughts, in the same way that I intend them. And so there's not going to, say, going to be the connection that I want to make with you, that what I'm saying, which is probably true right now as well. He rejects perfection of communication. In the city of God, then, he does this on, well, in, this, in the Genesis commentary, he does it with regard to understanding the cosmos. He rejects perfectionism. And then he, with the city of God, he rejects it. And so we live in this world of uncertainty, of gray, difficulty, and challenge. And that is our life. And any attempt to make it something not in this world now is a falsehood for Augustine. And so we have to live with a degree of uncertainty. We have to live with a degree of, of, of pain and of fear and of difficulty because I'm not going to find the perfect governor. He knew this well. The, the person who he dedicated the city of God to, Marcellinus, who is the magistrate of Numidia, the, the, the province he was in, was put to death um, for possible disloyalty by the emperor. He understood the bloody reality of, of political power. So you're not going to find it in this life now. Now, there are shadows of it. There are reflections of it. There are moments of it. So you can look at uh, my church, and hopefully you see moments in which the city of God emerges in moments, in bits, in pieces, but it's always fragmentary. Same with the city of man. Sorry, that was a long sermon in response to your question. Thank you. Do, do you think that um, Trump was um, brought to power by God to try to you, change some of the... I, have, I mean, I look at... I, I, I'm sorry, I, don't, I didn't mean to bring politics here, but... Boy, I'm going to get myself into big trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> no, you look at um, what's happening right now. It's almost like a radical left has taken over the Democratic Party and what they're trying to do with impeaching the president and all the good that he's done. I, I don't know. I, I find it very disconcerting. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know what... God, what I, I, I don't... Um, I am not one who affir affirms manifest destiny. I think America has no special place in world history. I think there can be special moments in our history. I think we can do some good and we could have done a lot of bad. Um, and um, politically, I think there are people who come and do things that I wish they wouldn't do and things that, I, that cause me great dismay. Um, whether God raised Trump up or not, 
I have no ability to save. And I really begrudge those who make such an assertion about any political figure because we don't have the perception or the basis to judge particular political moments because we're part of the system. To make such an assertion means that you're standing outside the system. You, I, anyone in this room are part of this world. <laughs> we're in the system and we can't determine the particular providence of God and where it's headed in any given moment. Think about your life and you know, for the junior members in the room, you perhaps have seen this too, but I, I just did a lecture for the, the Oxford students, the Skio students on, particularly we, we do a series on vocation. I was talking about vocation. One of my senses of vocations is building bridges. So I'm, I, I stand as a bridge between you know, a secular and religious academies, for example, um, at Oxford. Well, part of the story I had to tell them is how many burnt bridges I've had. <laughs> bridges I've done the burning on or others have done to me. And that's part of my story. And moments I thought were the worst, I've learned things from that are part of, if you would call what some things have happened recently for me success, I think it's still too close to call that. But things that are some of the great graces in my life now came only as a result of the worst burnt bridges. And that takes a long history. And to talk in ultimate terms about a particular politician or political policy as if we can determine the will of God in and through that, Augustine would say, no, thank you. And I can't say much different than that. Thank you very much for your wonderful lecture. Um, does Augustine have a, a view on those who are good, who are not Christian? Does he count them as evil, or do they fit into the... Yeah. His well, first, he would say all. all of us have a degree of evil afflicted. So that's part of this. That this, So the city of God and city of man are deeply intermixed in, in who we are. Now, some of us have been redeemed. And, and he does have idea of particular redemption affecting some. And that comes out particularly in his doctrine of predestination. Um, and so that is a part. So he does have a view that there are some who are saved and some who are damned. Now, he doesn't teach, as later Calvinists would, double predestination. So he does not teach that God intended some from the beginning to be damned and some from the beginning to be saved. He does, uh, uh, he does um, intend some to be saved. So that is, for Augustine, all are headed towards damnation. God preemptively pulls a few out. And you can question the validity of that position. That's another thing, but let's get his position right so we can then question on a good basis, um, on the right basis. Um, so he does think that there are some particular ones who are Christians, who are followers of Christ, and some who are not, and those who are not would be damned, and those who are, uh, who are called and chosen would follow. So he does have a clear distinction. But it's clear that he is thinking about the value that even those who are not, um, uh, who are not Christians bring to the conversation. So take a look at the title of his, his book, his big book that no one's read the full version of, The City of God. He called his great and arduous book with good cause. Um, why does he call the title? Like, if you're a biblical scholar, is City of God the obvious phrase you would use for that? Probably not. You'd probably say the kingdom of God. So why does Augustine use City of God? Why, why that analogy? Why that image? He's using Cicero. Cicero gives him the language to think about society and the tool by which he evaluates it. And he does this wittingly. This isn't, a, isn't accidental. He starts in book two. He talks about Cicero's idea of a commonwealth. And he says, but I'm going to come back to it. It takes him all around, a whole lot of building blocks. And finally, in book 19, he really gets back to evaluating Cicero's idea of a commonwealth. But he's consciously using Cicero as a tool to help him think it through. So does he think that there's nothing good to be had? He doesn't. It's obvious he thinks that there's some value to be had from working with those who are not Christians and to be gained, in this case, intellectually, and even the image of reality that he picks. But there's still a distinction between those who are saved and those who are damned. Is that helpful? <laughs> All right, what intriguing thoughts. I think you have um, earned your way to have refreshment. And would you continue to bring those thoughts to um, 
converse with Dr. Rosenberg and amongst ourselves as well. Well, would you help me thank Dr. Rosenberg? Thank you. Well, thank you.